Knowledge for Men, episode 109. Welcome to knowledgeformen.com, where you're going to grow into the man you want to be. Your life will never be the same again. I can guarantee it. Hey guys, one of the questions I've been getting a lot lately is, can you put together a list of the best books and success quotes from all of your guests and combine that into one guide? And so I've actually just done that. It's called the top 30 books and success quotes every man must live by. So out of all of the podcast episodes I've done, over 60, I finally put together this guide and you can download it for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Leo Babauta. He's a simplicity blogger and creator of Zen Habits, a top 25 blog with millions of readers from around the world. He's also a best-selling author, husband, and father of six children. He's a perfect example of what it means to live the simple life. Leo, happy to have you on the show. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. All right, Leo, so we kick start off every show with a favorite success quote of the guest, something they've lived by. So what do you got for us? And be sure to explain why you chose it. Yeah, well, I don't have... Too many success quotes, but uh, one that's kind of guided me in, in living simply is by uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the uh, Zen Buddhist monk, um, and his quote is, smile, breathe, and go slowly. So I just kind of, that helps me to kind of, like when I'm rushing too much and uh, complicating life too much, I just follow that. But um, for my, the, the new book that's coming out, I have another quote that, that goes something like, the art of life lies in constant readjustment to our surroundings. And so that's actually guided me in the last year or two where I'm constantly readjusting to our ever-changing you know, environment, whether that's online or my personal life. Uh, and it helps me to kind of move through the world with a lot of peace and calm and you know, not take things so hard when plans fall apart. Yeah, and I think this is really good for just living in the now and really embracing where we are and yeah absolutely and so now i want to get a deeper understanding like really how did this journey start you know it's such an interesting journey to to talk to successful bloggers because it's not easy to to write and to make a living off it let alone you you have a large family six children so i know I'm, i'm interested how did this start so go ahead and take the mic and share your story here sure <laughs> so I was born. No. Yeah, actually, my my real journey, though, the one that I write about is it started about nine years ago in 2005. And I've written about this on my site. But for those who don't know it, basically, I was stuck in my life in an unhealthy life where I was a smoker and I couldn't quit despite trying to quit a whole bunch of times. I was overweight, probably 70 pounds heavier than I am now, uh, eating lots of junk food, sedentary. I couldn't get exercise going full of clutter. I wasn't li- uh, living a, a simple life. My time was upside down so that I couldn't find time for my wife and family. I was deeply in debt and I couldn't make ends meet and on and on. So it there, there was just a really bad picture and I was in a bad place and I just felt really bad about myself. And so from that, I, um, I decided I needed some kind of change. And so I really focused on making one change after trying to make a whole bunch of changes at once. And I failed at, at those a bunch of times. Uh, so I decided to stick to one change, and that one was quitting smoking, and uh, just pour myself into it, and just make that one stick. And I learned a lot about making changes when I when I made that stick, and it, it worked. So I quit on November 18, 2005, and uh, haven't smoked since then. Uh, and that was my quit date, and I, I like I tried all kinds of things to see what would work to make that work that stick, and. Um, I tried a bunch of techniques and I found ones that worked and ones that didn't matter so much. And I tried them for the next habit, which was to start running. And a year later, I ran my first marathon. I've now run several marathons and a 50 mile ultra marathon. The next habit that I did was like changing my diet. Just definitely, I've, I've gone from junk food to healthier food in general. And it was one after the other, I started changing my life one habit at a time, one small step at a time. And the change was so amazing and so like transformative that I was like so excited about that stuff and I wanted to share it with people because like I thought I couldn't change. I know there's a lot of other people who think the same thing, uh, but I could. I, I'm like a walking example of someone who was stuck and got out of that. So I started blogging on Zen Habits in uh, January 2007 and 
the blog just took off because it turns out people wanted that message of like how to change their lives and also uh, how to simplify their lives. It was something that resonated with a lot of people. So I wrote a lot about simplicity and getting rid of clutter and slowing down and being more mindful. And that seemed to really resonate with a lot of people. And so the blog took off. And like you said, it's, it's had a lot of success. I've sold numerous books. And that brings us to today when I'm putting out what I think is my best book yet. And it's just called Zen Habits. Uh, mastering the art of change. All right, so quite the journey, and you started off with quitting smoking. So right off the bat, my immediate thought was <laughs> that's probably the hardest habit to start with. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I thought maybe lose ten pounds, or you Absolutely. know, well, congratulations on that. And you said November eighteenth was your anniversary, so that just happened, and and that's actually the anniversary of when I launched this podcast last year. So that's oh, wow. exciting. Now with Zen habits. What is the connection with Zen and Eastern philosophy to habit building? Yeah, so I'm a very practical guy, not at all into mysticism or anything like that. And so anything that's like woo-woo, that kind of stuff, I usually just kick it out the door. <laughs> but uh, for me, it was like about finding things that, that really made a lot of sense and put them into practice and see, what they, see if they work. So my life is like a whole bunch of experiments. And when those experiments work really well, I share that with people. And so one of the things that I, I thought, well, let's try this, you know, Zen Buddhism sounds interesting, but I'm not a Buddhist, but let's see what it has to offer. And so I started just with some simple like meditation and I'd read about how great meditation is. And the transformation that happened in me when I started learning about mindfulness was like amazing. It was like 10,000 times uh, what I'd been doing before um, in terms of knowing what I was doing and being able to to implement change. And so just the idea of sitting and just paying attention to your breath for even a couple minutes a day, it really taught me a lot about what was going on inside my mind and how my mind just like runs to the, the latest urges that it has. And because I was now able to see what was going on, I was able to change it. And if you don't, if you're not able to see it, you're not going to be able to change it. So mindfulness was, for me, started out as like a big way to just see what was going on, and so that I could change it. Another thing that it did was it taught me how to like appreciate little things that I had just ignored because I was too busy. So just kind of noticing things that were going on in the moment and appreciating it really helped me to enjoy each moment more, which actually, believe it or not, helps with habit change. So <laughs> enjoying the habit change makes the habit a reward in and of itself. And so that gives you a positive feedback cycle, which is a very you know, scientific concept of having positive feedback loops uh, versus negative feedback loops that helps you stick with the habit longer. So mindfulness actually gives you those positive uh, feedback loops. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I learned from Zen. So I, I try to pull the most practical stuff from uh, Zen Buddhism uh, and share that with people. Huh. So with all these life experiments you've completed successfully, you've learned quite a bit. So what is the best way to start a habit and continue that habit? Because a lot of us can start it, but you know, a month or two later, you know, life just hits us in the face and then that habit dies. <laughs> well, I've written a whole book about this topic, so I don't know how much time you have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But, uh, but uh, so, but basically, to give you the, the nutshell, uh, one, the best way to start is super small, like as small as you possibly can. Like when I started running, I told you I ran a you know, marathon, ultra marathon, but I could not have done that when I first started. So I couldn't even run 10 minutes. That's how you know, out of shape I was. So I would go out and just run for like two or three, maybe five minutes. And I could do that. That, that was doable. And so making the habit really small and really doable is really important. And that's not only important for getting started, because a lot of us don't start because we, you know, we keep putting it off. But if we do it, make it small, we, we can you know, make it something that's doable and you can get started. But it's also important for keeping the habit going. So a lot of times we like get really excited about a change and we like put, you know, we do as much as we can right away, you know, go big or go home kind of thing. <laughs> and the idea, um, though, is that you start out really big and you like run out of gas after a week and then you just quit because you're like, you don't have all the energy anymore. You don't have time to do a huge habit every single day. You can't do an hour of exercise every day if you're just starting out. You haven't, you know, adjusted your life to fit that hour yet. So start out with five minutes and just go for a five minute run or do push up, you know, do five push ups. Um, and if you just start out with something small like that, that's much more sustainable. And you can get that going for like a month 
And after a month, you can that becomes much more automatic, and your your life kind of adjusts to that. So that that five minutes becomes your new normal. And then after a while, you can expand that and, and go longer. And eventually, you'll be doing that hour long exercise routine, but you don't start out that way. So starting small and focusing on one habit at a time, those are my biggest tips. And the other thing is just kind of surround yourself with the right environment. So you know, you you might have heard the a success quote about how we're the, the product of the five people that surround us the most. Yeah, Jim Rohn. Yeah. So if we the same thing is, is true of habits. If you surround yourself with people who are going to support that habit change or going to hold you accountable who will not let you off the hook, um, you're much more likely to stick with the habit. So that's what I, I say. Start small with one habit at a time and surround yourself with people who are going to support that habit. Yeah, I like that. So just running three minutes and then five minutes and then just add a little bit more each time and then eventually you're doing ultra marathons. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the same thing, you know, if you wanted to meditate, don't start out by trying to meditate for half an hour. Do like one minute a day, two minutes a day. And that's something you can't say no to. And that's what you want the habit to be is something you just can't say no to because otherwise you will say no to it. So you gotta, you gotta make it like, there's unobjectionable basically. And so I'm gonna assume that you've applied the same strategy to your writing with your blog and, and the books that you've published. Um, you know, what has your relationship with writing been like? What's your journey been like with writing? Yeah, well, I did come out of the womb as uh, basically a genius writer, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, the, the, the habit of writing definitely, you get better at it as you go. So you gotta just like, create the habit and you know the, the weeks and months of doing that habit, you're going to get better and better at it. But I've been writing for, I don't know, 25 years. And so yeah, my writing's definitely gotten a little bit better over those, those years. But for me, the, the, the way to start small with a writing habit is just open up a document and write one sentence. And sometimes that's just like writing my name at the top of a post. <laughs> and if I can get that going... And like, then the next day, you date it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you're basically, you've gotten the ball rolling. And a lot of times, this is the same thing with running. Sometimes I would just tell myself, oh, I can't even get out and do five minutes. So what I would do is say, all you got to do is put on your shoes and get out the door. And if you've done that, that's a success. And that would be like, oh, I can't, I can't not do that, right? So you would do that. And once you're out the door, then you were like, you know what? How stupid would it be to turn around and go back and lay on the couch? So you would start running just for a few minutes. And then you start feeling good about it and you start going. So you're just kind of getting over that initial obstacle. But for writing, it's the same thing. If you start just writing one sentence, you might now feel like, oh, I got a couple more things I thought of. And, and you just get that ball rolling and then things start flowing. So, I mean, you might not write that much, even if you've, you know, if you've written that one sentence, but it might open the door to, you know, writing a lot more. So get the ball rolling, overcome that initial hurdle, and then things will get a lot easier from there. Yeah, it's a simple approach to habit forming. So now with writing or anytime someone's going to do something creative, you know, you have to tap into that creative side. So you've published several books and you have your upcoming book coming out, uh, which seems to be the pinnacle of your books. So I'm wondering, what do you do to tap into that flow state on a regular basis? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One is that I, I put myself in a state of solitude. So I think, you know, online, it's great that we're so connected, but it's also so distracting. So you have to kind of sometimes cut off those connections and say, I'm just going to sit here with this idea and see what comes out of it. And so that's, you know, even if it's just 20 minutes of like being disconnected and sitting there with a blank document or a blank sheet of paper, just give yourself that solitude. Um, sometimes for me, I have to like go out and take a walk just to get the blood flowing and the mind start to think. It also, going out for a walk not only gets the blood flowing, but you're like, you know, now disconnected from all the other stuff. So leave your phone behind if you do that. Uh, so solitude is really important, but connection, the other side of the coin is connection also is really important because as we go online, we're reading, you know, a great blog like Knowledge for Men. You're reading other people's amazing ideas and you might, you know, Andrew might have his own ideas, but he's also getting ideas from other people through his podcast, through other successful people. And so he's like bringing together a whole bunch of really amazing ideas. And not all of those ideas are going to stick for each reader, but one of those might spark something. And so being connected and finding other people who have great ideas or who are sharing other ideas, to me that's really important for cre creativity because one of those ideas is going to spark something. 
And sometimes what that spark is, is taking um, an idea that has worked in one field and applying it to another. So that's what I've done with like changing habits is I found ideas that worked in the, in the field of, let's say, software creation. I'm like, oh, that idea is amazing. How can I apply that to habits? And so creativity is sometimes making those connections that, that haven't been made before, but the idea is already there. You're just kind of looking at it in a new way or applying it in a new way. So that's really, for me, creativity is just about that, making those new connections with old ideas um, in new ways. So um, you kind of need that online connectivity to, to do that, to find those ideas that are going to spark some, some new connection. Huh, I like that. And I read the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, so, so you understand the idea of resistance. It's this battle going on inside of ourselves that's preventing us from getting our best work out. Yeah. So everyone experiences at all levels. And when you have those moments of resistance where you can't create and you're, you're struggling to, to, to get it out, how do you handle that situation? Yeah, so I mean, that's actually a big part of my book is, is that resistance. And, um, you know, The War of Art, you know, Stephen wrote about it so well. But for, for my, I'm looking at it from a different perspective. But that resistance is there always. Like whether you're a writer or you're changing your habits or creating a new business, starting an exercise program, that resistance is there. And overcoming it is like the key to, to, to the whole thing. So um, I found some techniques that are like really useful in, in overcoming that resistance. One is, I already mentioned it, is just lowering the bar, just making it unobjectionable. So if the resistance is really high, like I said, you know, just go and say, I'm just going to open up the document and, op- and write one sentence. So that helps by lowering the resistance. You're lowering the, the obstacle to getting started. Another one, too, is just to kind of put yourself in that space. Again, open up a document and close everything else. Shut off your phone and say, I'm just going to stay here with this. And the resistance is going to come up and you're going to say, oh, I need to go and check my email or something, right? (laughs) So what you need to do is you watch this urge rise up in you because it doesn't want to stay here in this uncomfortable place because we don't want to be in this scary place of needing to create something. Um, And we want to go and run to something that's more comfortable. So you watch this urge come up and usually we don't see the urge. That's where mindfulness comes into play is we can now see the urge arising to go check your email or go check Facebook or whatever it is. And so you see the urge coming up and normally we just go and run and follow that urge. And so what I'm saying is watch the urge, but then don't follow it. Put a pause between the urge coming up and the action. So you can now consciously decide what is it that you want to do? Is it best for you to go check your latest Facebook posts or is it best for you to sit here and stay with this uncomfortable task? So that's another big one is watching the urge and not necessarily acting on it. And another one is getting okay with that discomfort and that uncertainty. So we want to run from it so we can go and do something easier. But if you find out that you can be uncomfortable and can, you can be in this uncertainty because you know writing, for example, or starting a business or something like that is full of uncertainty. You don't know if this writing is going to be any good, if anyone's going to like it. That's why we want to run from it. But when you find out that you, you can be in this place of uncertainty and still write, then that's kind of an amazing breakthrough because uh, you don't have to run from it. You can say, okay, I'm, I'm not feeling too good about this, but I'm going to keep doing it. And that, that leads to amazing places if you can stick with that uncertainty and that discomfort. Oh, that was good. And I'm wondering, do you have any routines that you do in the morning? I know a lot of people are really into like creating these these like power hours or, the, or these, these miracle mornings that really help you set up your day so that it, it makes it so you're just more productive. You're going to have a more successful day, and, and this will just kind of prevent that resistance from happening. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've experimented with a lot of different routines, and they all work for a little while, <laughs> and then, then they fall apart. You know, they, they, everything falls apart in the face of resistance. And I, I, I don't know if you ever watched MMA uh, fighting, you know, the UFC types. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, you know, uh, one of the best power opponents, um, as they come into the, the championship fight against him and they say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this and this and this. And John says, everyone has a plan until they get hit on the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean that that's what happens when when you you have this routine and and then you get hit in the face by resistance. It's like everything falls apart after a while um, because resistance is really hard. And so for me, 
I, I've tried a bunch of different things and they all last for a little while and then resistance comes and then you have to like try a new routine. So um, that, that's really what I do is I, I try something new. My latest thing is I, I write my articles and my book in the browser, like in a Google Doc or in WordPress. So I'm, I open up a browser tab and I'm writing my thing, but then I want to go and check, you know, like, like I said, email or social media or read something online. And so I'll open up another tab. So my latest thing is uh, only allow yourself to have one tab open. And, you know, normally we have like 20 tabs. All, <laughs> yeah, I have like all five tabs open right now. Browser. <laughs> and so we're like switching between them and we feel really productive and also distracted. But if you only had one tab open, then you have to say, well, what tab do I want to open right now? And that might be, you know, I need to go do some research on, you know, whatever. But, you know, eventually you have to decide, is this research more important than the writing? Or do I need to do email right now? And so you decide what is the best use of my time right now and say no to every other tab. And that's kind of like a metaphor for life, too, because basically all of life is like opening up new tabs, right? Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, so if we can just say all I can do right now is just this one tab, you close everything else, you bookmark them or you, you save them in a you know, Evernote uh, document where you have like a whole bunch of things to check out later. But basically, you're closing everything else one at a time. And those things you can come back to later, but for now, you're just going to do this one thing. And for me, that's, that's been really useful you know, for now until I get hit in the face again. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like that'd be a good Chrome app, you know, just one tab and it yeah. prevents you from opening up uh, other tabs. Well, right now, Leo, I'm looking at your blog and it's extremely simple, Zen Habits. And if you look at other sites, you know, there's so much going on. There's just things everywhere and it's really confusing, yet you have this really simple layout to your website. So, you know, what, what's the meaning behind this? Why have you gone just such a real clear, simple type of route? Yeah, well, it's it was an evolution. So, like, I definitely had way more things when I first started. It's kind of that philosophy of simplifying is, like, you start to identify the essential and you just eliminate the rest. You just declutter everything that's not absolutely essential. And when you do this process, it's a series of, of stages where you're like, okay, I can eliminate, you know, 50% of what's on here and you're left with 50%. But then you ask your, the same question of that the left, the 50% that's left, and you say, well, what if this is essential? Until you're just like winnowing it down to one thing at a time and you're left with like one thing left. And so for me, for my blog, what I decided is the most essential thing that I want people to do is to read an article. And when there's all kinds of other stuff on the blog, then I'm also asking them to give their attention to my newsletter and to all these other blog posts here that I'm trying to get their attention with and maybe buy my book and maybe you know, join my program and maybe go and check out these other things. And so I'm actually spreading their attention, but when I, what I really want them to do is read this article. That's like the most important thing. And if they like that article and they find use in it, then they might want to go and, and find out more about me or, or read a book of mine. But until they do that, that action of reading that article, all that other stuff, they're not sold yet. So they have to like that I'm there to help them and that I have some useful ideas. And if they don't, if I can't convince them of that, they're not going to want to do the rest of the stuff. So I have to just let them read that article and get out of their way. So I take everything else on the page, take it off and just let them read the article. That's all they have to do. Um, and there's, you know, at the bottom, there's a few other links, but that's only after they're done with the article. So that's, that's the idea is simplify down to the absolutely essential. And I try and do that with pretty much everything in my life. And of course, if you don't, if you're not like absolutely like vigilant about that and just brutal about saying no to stuff, then the, the clutter starts to creep in. And it's easy to do on a website. It's easy to do with a business. It's easy to do in your personal life. The things just like there's feature creep, clutter creep. It's just, it just adds up over time. So you have to kind of every now and then say, okay, what's essential here? And then just you know, ruthlessly get it rid of everything else. So kind of like the power of no. Yeah. You're talking about your blog, but also in your life. We have all these opportunities that are presented in front of us every day. And sometimes just saying no and focusing on what's in front of you right now is what's most important. Yeah, and so the, and no sounds like horrible because you're like you're saying no to opportunities and all these other things. We want to say yes to them all, but you know if you look at it from the other way, is if you say yes to everything, you're really not saying yes to them because you can't possibly give your full attention to any one of those things. If you say yes to 20, 50 different things, you're not really taking advantage of any of those opportunities because you're not really pouring yourself into it. If you say no to everything else, it's because you're going to say yes to what's most important and really give yourself to that. 
but um, you you can't do that unless you start saying no to some things. So you have, I mean, you're always going to make choices, and a lot of people just make the choice to say yes to everything, which really is not saying yes. To me, that's that's a suboptimal choice. So I try and make the the optimal choice, which is say you say no to most of the things and say yes to what I really want to do the most. Yeah, I like that. So I'm wondering, what has your journey been like? as a blogger. I mean, you started out working full time with the government and yeah. then you started this blog. So what has your monetizing journey been like? You know, because you, you've chosen this, you know, very simple website. Uh, you're, you're not really asking for much at all. There's no like pop ups, like, you know, you're not, you don't, it doesn't seem like you're doing like this big funnel, you know, Facebook ads, you know, yeah, yeah. targeting. So has this been a longer journey for you? Or have you found that just by being real and authentic and just giving good content to people, this pays larger dividends? Yeah, well, I mean, no, no, no journey is is like that simple, right? It's always gonna be messy. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I when I first started, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I said, I started the blog in two thousand seven, and so I, I, when I discovered this is like really what I wanted to do, I poured myself into it, tried to build my audience. But I also w- wanted to like monetize so that I could quit my day job. And like you said, I was working for the government um, when I was living on Guam at the time. And uh, so I'm like, okay, well, how can I make money off of this? And I had no idea. So I put ads, and you know, I, I remember one month I made five dollars for my ads. I was like, "Yes!" <laughs> <laughs> I bet you were excited. That was a good month. <laughs> that was amazing. But I, you know, I soon learned, you know, after a few months that that doesn't really pay. I mean, unless you have a, a huge audience, ads aren't going to make you a lot of money. Um, and the thing that really started to—I tried a whole bunch of different things, affiliate stuff, and uh, the thing that really paid off was when I sold my first ebook and. People loved that because it was what I was giving on the blog they already liked, but going deeper into it and pre- presenting it in a way that was like readable and accessible. And so they loved the ebook. And that was like an eye opener for me. I'm like, wow, the ebook made so much more money than all the other stuff combined. And I tried to figure out why that was. And it was because people already trusted me as a writer. And so they trust that this ebook is going to be something good for them. They don't trust the ads on my site. The ads are for some other thing that I don't, I don't even endorse. It's just some code that I slapped on there. I don't even know what ads are going to go on there. Um, and so I'm not really endorsing those things. For affiliate stuff, I might be endorsing you know, some, someone else's product, but I can't really stand behind it because it's you know, not necessarily something I've used or really believe in. It's definitely not something I created. Um, and even if I did believe in it, people are more likely to trust something from me than from, you know, that they already know than from someone they don't know who I'm saying, you know, go, go check this person out. So uh, affiliate stuff is better than, than ads, but your own content that you sell is much better than affiliate stuff. And so I sold eBooks, and what I found that works even better is uh, my membership program, which mo- much more of a hands-on live thing where I would give them like a live webinar where they can ask me questions. That's way better than an ebook, um, and so they're willing to pay for that on an ongoing basis. That's been my best monetizer is you know really getting hands-on and helping people with with habits, creating forums for them where they can like j- uh, join accountability teams, um, and so that kind of stuff turns out to be much better because I'm really, you know, focused on helping people and they, you know, for me the most monetizable thing is not any kind of number but it's trust. And so by building trust through my my blog, people want, you know, they they know they they trust me and they want more from me and so I either give them that through ebooks or a print book like I'm coming out with now or my membership program. And they know, you know, that they, they find my stuff useful and that I'm not there to rip them off. So everything that I have on my blog and on my site is about uh, maintaining that trust. So I don't have any pop-up ads because I think pop-up ads, they erode trust. They're basically you trying to, like, pitch, you know, this email list that people don't want uh, so that they can, you can build up your, your uh, email subscriber list, but people aren't there for that. They're there for the content. So I, I get out of their way, I let them have the content, and I don't erode the trust. And by doing that, people are much more likely to buy some of my products, which is just an extension of that trust. So that's kind of been my journey, and I don't, don't pretend to have any, I mean, all of the answers, but that's what I've found through my experiments. And obviously, you've been doing this for quite some time. You said 2007. You have multiple courses and, and, and books you're offering. I'm looking at your site here. So 
you know, now, you know, do you have any advice for someone who's thinking about starting a blog or someone who's struggling to grow or monetize their blog? Yeah, I mean, uh, or how about this? Knowing what you know now, Leo, what would you tell yourself in 2007 when you started blogging? Yeah, I mean, it's that's a really tough place to be in and like I definitely don't have all the answers, but one one thing that helped, first of all, is just kind of developing like adjust your content to to help people more, uh, help your readers more. So try to understand who they are, what their problems are, and how you can better help them. And if they're not responding well to that, then you have to kind of adjust. And so some, some ways to do that are to take on some of your readers um, who want you know, a coach and coach them. So this is like a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. And through coaching, you're going to find out what works and what doesn't because you're getting instant feedback. You give them something to do, they do it, they find out this doesn't work for them, and you're finding out that you're, maybe your advice isn't working as well. And you're also finding out what does work. And so through that kind of coaching process, you're going to find out ideas and principles that will, will help not only this one person, but you can generalize to, to a larger audience. So you know, kind of adjust your content uh, until it's extremely useful. And once you've gotten to that point, you still might not have a bit, very big audience. So the thing that, that helped me the most was to do guest posts for other blogs. And, you know, a blog with, you know, 50,000 readers is not going to want someone who has, like, 50 readers, right? So you're not probably not going to get very many guest posts on large blogs. So what I would do is something that I called the, uh, there's, like, a ladder that I visualized. Like, I had 50 readers. And so I would go to another blog that had maybe 100 readers, like, twice as many as I did. And they're much more likely to accept a guest post from me because they don't have that many readers compared to someone who had 1,000 or 10,000. So I would go for that 100. Once I got to 100, I went for you know, the blogs with 200 readers and then 400 and then you know, so on up the ladder because they're much more likely to accept one from you. Uh, but guest posts are the best way to, to get new audience because what you're doing is you're going onto someone else's blog, you're giving them really useful content. That audience then reads that content and says, wow, this is great. Who's this Leo uh, Babauta? And they check out the link and go and find out more. And this interview is, is another example of that. This is kind of me trying to be extremely useful on your blog for your audience. And if they like it, maybe they'll go check out my stuff. So uh, uh, interviews is another way to do that. But guest posts often, if no one knows who you are, they're not going to want to interview you. So often, you know, just offering to do a guest post um, is a great way to do that. And then I would do guest post exchanges so that you let someone else guest post on your blog and you do one on theirs. And that's kind of what I did to get started. And that helped a lot. I wrote a lot of guest posts my first year, and it really, it really worked. So that, those were my two biggest things. Uh, in terms of monetization, it's, nothing is going to work until you have an audience. So build the audience first, and the monetization uh, will be a lot easier later. Yeah, that's great advice. I know there's a lot of listeners here starting or looking to start a blog, so I know that's valuable feedback for them. So now, Leo, let's dive into the knowledge round. Are you ready? I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Do you ever have so many books to read that you end up not reading at all? You have so many books in your library on your list of books that you want to read, but you don't know which books to tackle first. I know in all of my episodes, I ask guests, what are your favorite books? What are your most influential books? And they always list three or four. And I always ask guests for their favorite success quote. I find that quotes can be so powerful sometimes, yet there's so many available. So what I've done is I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that I think every man must live by. And these are directly from guests on the Knowledge for Men podcast. And as you know, some of the guests on my show sold their companies for millions of dollars. They're running billion dollar organizations. They're dating coaches. They're health coaches. They're entrepreneurs. They're celebrities on TV. They're mixed martial artists. Just this wide variety of great minds. And I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that every man must live by. You can download this guide for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in 3, 2, 1, showtime. All right, Leo, first question here. What advice would you give to someone who's feeling kind of lost or unsure of what they should do with their life? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, what I would say is start to build things and be around interesting people, smart people. And uh, that's 
been like a winning form formula for me. So you start to build something, whether it's a website or you know, learn how to code and, and make a little app, uh, build a business, you know, be a coach, do something where you're making something new in the world, even if that's on the side as you're a student or if you have a day job, start to build something and surround yourself with interesting or smart people. That helps support that, that change. But if you start to do something, you start to gain some confidence in yourself, you start to build some trust in yourself that you're going to stick with something, and surrounding yourself with those people helps you to stick with something, so that helps you build the trust. And so that's what I would say is those two things. All right, I like it. And Leo, what was holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? Yeah, what I talked about in the last answer was that trust in myself. I, I didn't have it. I, um, I felt really bad, about, really bad about myself, you know, failing at a bunch of habits. And um, not having that trust in myself, kind of, it's kind of like a, you're in a relationship. You, someone keeps like walking out on you, you stop, you stop trusting them. And so you have to build that trust back. And once you have that trust, you can start to, you know, like I said, build something new. You can start to create new habits. You can start making changes in your life. But it's really hard to do that if you don't trust yourself. So you have to build that trust a little bit at a time. Huh, that's good. And Leo, has there been someone who's played a large, someone who's had a large impact on your growth, on your journey, a mentor? And is there a specific moment that you could share that was really impactful for you? Oh man, <laughs> there's so many people. Like I think we're all just like this connected to a web of other people who are like supporting us and inspiring us, and we're learning from them. So I can name like some amazing writers, amazing bloggers, people in business. You know, then there's my mom uh, who has been. <laughs> Huge inspiration to me, but uh, I think probably the biggest person who's helped me in my um, my journey is my wife Eva. She's been there supporting me like every step of the way. She's been like my backbone, my support network, person who roots me on, the person who takes care of the kids while I, I need to focus on writing my book. Um, and so I like I wouldn't be the person I am or where I am without her. So deeply indebted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially back in 2007, you're like, hey, I'm going to start this blog and you know, we're going to live <laughs> off of it. You know, just not too many people were doing that back then. And now, you know, this is probably going to be a tough question. You might dislike this question the most, Leo, but, you know, what, is your three, what are your three most influential books and why? Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Let's see. Because I, I love books so much. There's so many. <laughs> I'm just narrowing them down. Uh, the, the Tao Te Ching was a big one on, uh, for me. It really kind of helped me try new things in life. Marcus Aurelius' uh, Meditations. I'm trying to think of profound ones, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy would be my, one, of the, another one that influenced who I am. <laughs> but uh, Hitchhiker's Guide is kind of more... Um, don't panic <laughs> is the uh, overriding philosophy there. Yeah, that that's big because we often, you know, panic because we are not where we would like to be in life and time is passing and yeah. that's huge. Leo, scenario. You have 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell him to do and what would you tell him not to do? Oh, man. Yeah, I've actually written a book, uh, post on that and now I'm trying to remember the great things I wrote because I, I know it was brilliant. But <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my... The biggest advice, I think, was to, again, to build something, uh, to build that trust in yourself. Uh, but I think the thing that held me back was just not thinking I could do it. I really didn't think much of myself. And so I, I kept just doing what was safe, uh, what everyone else told me I was supposed to do, and like going on the path of least resistance. What I figured out later is I'm much more capable than that 20-year-old self believed himself capable of. I have much more in me than that, and I... That doubt cost me about a decade or more of, of not doing anything really cool. And I, I, I lost a decade because of that. So believe in yourself, which sounds really trite, but if I could get my 20-year-old self to believe in himself, <laughs> I think that would have changed my life. But, you know, that said, I am who I am because of the journey I've been on. I've made a lot of mistakes, and those have informed who I am. So I don't think I would change anything. But it would be cool to go back and slap my younger self around and tell, say, Stop doubting yourself so much. <laughs> yeah, Stop awesome. playing the safe thing. And, and it's okay to, to take the path um, that has more resistance because you get stronger from that. Oh, and one other thing that I would tell that 20-year-old. Don't eat so many Oreos. <laughs> it it, it uh, really pissed off my later self who had to burn off those calories later. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, just all kinds of junk food. Oreo being like the, the symbolic one. But uh, I ate too much pizza, drank, drank too much soda. It was just really bad. And uh, my stomach showed it later on. <laughs> so I wish I could go back and, and slap that guy around and say, stop eating those Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, now, Leo, looking back at your 20-year-old self eating Oreos and pizza, just picture that 20-year-old Leo there <laughs> uh, to where you are now and, and all the things you've accomplished in between and helping millions of people be happier, which is really what you're doing. You're, you're not selling sugar water or anything like that. You're, you're selling happiness. You know, what would you say is your philosophy on life and success? All boiled down to one sentence, right? <laughs> you know, I, I think my philosophy is, is a lot about realizing how impermanent and how brief life is. Because um, I think when that 20-year-old self probably thought life is going to last forever. That's kind of how he treated life. That's why he ate all those Oreos, because he can always worry about it later, right? But if you realize how short life really is, um, it doesn't seem like it from day to day, but it really is short, and you don't have that much time to make the most of it. If you realize how short it is, you can start to not only, you know, produce and really focus yourself, but you can also just appreciate every moment as it's passing and every interaction you have with your kid who's here in the living room with you or your wife, you know, who you might take for granted sometimes or your friends who, you know, are busy with their lives. But, you know, every, every little moment with these people is, is a gift. And so you want to make the most out of that. So that's really been my, my philosophy of life is to realize the impermanence of life and realize that it's a gift that we need to make the most of and really appreciate. Wow. I'm just soaking that in. Um, that, that was good. That was really good. And, and that concludes the knowledge round right there, Leo. All right. That's <laughs> yeah, <you made> it. <laughs> <Live>. <laughs> All right. Well, Leo, you have this new book coming out, Zen Habits, Mastering the Art of Change. And I know you're running, you're doing it different. You're running a Kickstarter campaign, which is the only way people can get access to the book. And it's for a limited amount of time too. Uh, why, why is that? Why, why are you doing this, uh, taking this route? Yeah, I, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways you can do. You can go with a traditional publisher, but I really wanted this book to contain, like, it's my heart that's poured into this book. And it's, it's my way of really best helping uh, my readers. And so... This book is really me in paper form. <laughs> and so I decided instead of going the traditional publisher route and also instead of doing an ebook or selling on Amazon, I wanted to give it directly to readers and allow them to, to fund the printing of this and get it to them in a unique way. So not only are you, can you buy the book through Kickstarter and only on Kickstarter, but I'm offering a bunch of different things on there from uh, like from the highest level where I'll I'll coach you through the book for three months and then we'll have a live event here in San Francisco to, um, uh, you know, when, you know, I'm, I'm also giving you the chance to give some feedback and that's going to shape the book and another level where you can buy like six copies and give a bunch out to friends who you think might benefit from this book. So this is kind of a unique way to, to reach my readers in a way that I think is fun and allows them to show me if this is something that's important to them. And that's the way I look at this is this Kickstarter is, you know, I haven't printed the books yet, but people are going to tell me, send me a message through this Kickstarter is if they believe in this book, if they really want to see it in the real world, they're going to back it. And if they don't, then I, that's a message that, you know, maybe I should do some other project. So, you know, there's no fail or success with this project. It's tell me if you want this or not. And I'll, if not, I'll do something else. If, if you do, I'm going to go forward and print this and send it to you. And I think in doing so, we're going to change the world. If, if we fund this project and you take the book and you change your life, you've changed the world in some way, and then you can go and be that example of change for other people. And that change spreads, and it's amazing. I've changed myself, and you know, through that example, of, I've changed thousands of people. And they've changed thousands of other people. So it's kind of like this change movement. Um, and I, I really want that, this book to be the catalyst for that kind of movement. All right. So the next question is, is, you know, when's the Kickstarter <laughs> campaign going live and how can they access the campaign? I believe it's going to launch on November 17th. So you might already, uh, it might already be live by the time you're listening to this. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> and how long is the campaign going to last for? Uh, it should last for a month. Yeah, 30 days. And so uh, there's plenty of time. I, I'm going to make this at cost. So the, the, the goal of this is like 45,000, which covers printing and editing and a bunch of other stuff. But 
I'm not even going to get paid if we only hit the 45,000 mark. So I, I really want this book to be a reality. And so if, if I don't get paid, that's fine. I, I really want it to be in people's hands. And if they fund it more than that, you know, maybe I'll pay myself or maybe I'll, I'll take most of that and do a second printing and, and try and uh, reach even more people. So you know, I'm keeping it the, the cost low. We have 30 days to fund it. I don't really think it's going to be a problem. But I, uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun to, to get this book out and get it into people's hands. All right, so I'm going to make a blog post out of this. And for all the listeners who want to check out the Kickstarter campaign, uh, you, you can most likely just Google Zen Habits Kickstarter in Google, and it should be, it should be on that first page. If not, then just check out knowledgeformen.com and look for the blog post on Leo Babauta, and I'll have a link uh, that will go straight to that Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the book. Uh, I'm going to buy it one for sure and support the Kickstarter campaign myself. Awesome. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's really incredible times that we live in where you can avoid the publishers and you can get your project funded by your own community and, you know, impact, you know, thousands of lives that way. So it's just really interesting, really cool times that we live in. Totally agree. And just with that, thank you so much for your time. I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your story and your life lessons here with my community. I've, I've had an amazing time. I want to say thank you to you too for, for sharing me with your audience. I want to say, say thank you to anyone who's listening for spending your, you're giving us your attention and spending your time listening to this. And I want to promise you too, if you do go and buy the book, that it will be useful. Um, that's a guarantee or I will give you your money back. <laughs> Um, if you want to make any kind of change in your life, you want to learn, deal with life changes, if you want to deal with loss, if you're struggling with anything, um, this book is it's packed from cover to cover with uh, useful stuff. So it, and, this, and this stuff really works. So I, I promise you it'll be useful, and I hope you go out and check it out. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up episode 109 with Leo Babauta. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast show. It's been a pleasure having you be a part of a thriving community of men who want to crush it in all aspects of life. I'm on a mission here to inspire millions of guys. And with your help, we're going to make a dent in the universe. Check out knowledgeformen.com for a ton of free content that's designed to help you live a remarkable life. Again, that's knowledgeformen.com. I hope to see you there. And always remember, 2014 is the official year of the crush, where we take action to get the life we've always dreamed of. This is your host, Andrew Farabee, and until next time, let's do it.